Halloween Horror Nights 12 was definitely something special. The Caretaker, Treeks and Foons, demented remakes of beloved childhood classics, you know, you gotta love it. And not to mention the whole thing took place at Islands of Adventure, rather than the typical Universal Studios Florida. HHN 12 aka Islands of Fear was a relatively popular event that, as I mentioned, brought some soon-to-be Halloween Horror Nights favorites. And even though the park was used for Horror Nights until HHN 16, many fans who didn't get to experience this wish they could finally step into the fog where the adventure begins. And I am one of those fans. I think Islands of Adventure is a beautiful park, and I would love to see today's bar of theming when it comes to HHN be applied to Islands of Adventure. However, with rumors every year speculating if it's actually going to be here or if it's never going to come back, I wanted to see if what we collectively wish for could actually come true. Could Islands of Fear return? Should it return? And if so, how? Let's take a stroll past the Fosto's Lighthouse and see what the future could hold for Islands of Fear. Join me on a journey through your fears as I transform Universal's Islands of Adventure into one disturbing nightmare after another. So for those who don't know, yes, Universal did something bold for Halloween Horror Nights in 2002, choosing to move locations from Universal Studios Florida to Islands of Adventure. Originally set to be themed around the demented imagination of a creepy kid named Cindy Kane, the real-world kidnapping scandals of the time caused Universal to pivot away from that storyline, instead dedicating the event to her father, Albert Kane caretaker mad with power. He would be thinking up the horrors of this event, and one of the coolest things about Islands of Fear was that many of the IPs represented in the park's different islands got a freaky horror twist. Whether that be supervillains that killed off the heroes of Superhero Island and City Under Siege, or a prehistoric experiment gone wrong in JP Extinction. And Islands of Adventure being used to host HHN would continue for the next three years, with HHN 13 bringing another icon with the director, HHN 14 being the first and only time both parks were used for the event, and HHN 15 elevating event-wide theming with their next major icon, the storyteller. Now, when tackling whether Islands of Fear should really come back, the first question we must ask is, why should it come back? Why should Universal go through all that work to bring this back? Well, I already mentioned its popularity with the fans, but there's a pretty big practical reason for it to possibly be considered. For the past two years, crowds at HHN have been insane with overinflated wait times and bottleneck scare zones. And while the event grows in popularity every year, it felt like unanimously the crowds and management of those crowds was the biggest complaint and criticism for the past two years of the event. And even though Studios is a decent sized park, there's not really much room for them to expand with the event there. So why not try a dual park event with Islands of Adventure as well as Universal Studios? Because there's definitely room hidden for a couple houses and stage shows, along with the thematic backdrop to add all different kinds of scare zones. However, there's one overarching factor that really holds it back from going back to the Islands of Fear glory days that they had back in the early 2000s. And that is the many changes that this park has seen in recent years. See, with the last HHN event at Islands in 2005, we still had Merlinwood in the Lost Continent, the Triceratops Discovery Trail, the seasonal Thunderfalls Terrace, and a Discovery Center that didn't lead to a major attraction. With the addition of Kong Skull Island, the entirety of Hogsmeade, and the Velocicoaster, many of the former house locations at the park just aren't feasible anymore. And with Hogsmeade, JK Rowling has implemented the same kind of restrictions as she has with Diagon Alley, specifying that anything gory or extremely scary is to be prohibited, and the land must function as normal during the event. That, along with a similar contract for Seuss Landing, means two of the park's six lands are off the table. And while it's a more minor change, the last 17 years has seen the Marvel brand shift to Disney, and in a completely convoluted deal, Universal is prohibited to really do much with Marvel outside of touching up what already is there. That means they're not likely to do anything like Maximum Carnage from HHN 12, which has been the subject of fan interest since its departure. And logistically, the park has changed with a few key bottleneck areas that may be hard to really insert anything. So yeah, if Islands of Fear were to return, it wouldn't be the same event that we got all those years ago. 
but that's not necessarily the worst thing. Because remember, this wouldn't be an event exclusively at Islands of Adventure. It wouldn't be an event that shares both parks. So if Universal were to approach Islands of Fear today, how would they do it? Well, there are two prime spaces for houses that were used before that seem to be untouched right now. The first is the Carnage Warehouse, which sat behind Dr. Doom's Fearfall and held the Maximum Carnage House I mentioned earlier. Now, judging by the photos I've found in a quick size measurement, this building seems to be slightly bigger than a sprung tent, and the capabilities for scale inside such a small space could mean a pretty solid house location. And it seems like this space is really used for storage right now, so it's pretty available. The second pre-existing space is a much bigger one and can honestly be used at Islands of Fear or just an expansion to Universal Studios Hall of Horror Nights. I'm talking about a soundstage that hasn't been used in quite a while, Soundstage 20. This location was used for Scream House, the caretaker's icon house at Islands of Fear, but has been used up through 2013, hosting classics like All Night Die-In, the director's icon house, Hellgate Prison, and Interstellar Terror. Now this is a soundstage, which means there will be a lot of room for not just one, but two houses. As most of the soundstages have been divvied up into two different houses in recent years. And while the soundstage is more active than the Carnage Warehouse, hosting different production events, like I think they do wrestling here sometimes, this could be a viable option for them to put a house in. Now those are some locations that have already been used, but what about some that have never been used for Islands of Fear? When thinking about this, most people just automatically jump to Poseidon's Fury, and honestly, it's a solid option. The exterior facade is really well themed, and there is a large amount of space inside that shell building to put in a house on a massive scale. And if you needed to close the attraction down for the season to accommodate for HHN, you could do it with this one as it really only pulls high wait times on peak days, and it does have frequent downtime. Plus, it was closed for like two years, and I know some people really missed it, but for a while the park went business as usual without Poseidon's Fury being open. So based on the Carnage Warehouse, Soundstage 20, and Poseidon's Fury, that leaves us with four houses that can possibly be at this event. But Halloween Horror Nights isn't all about the houses, although it pretty much mostly is. What about the shows and scare zones? Honestly, shows are pretty easy because even without Poseidon's Fury, there are still two abandoned stages that can be used to house shows. The first one is the one they previously used for Bill and Ted back in the day over in Toon Lagoon. This thing pretty much just collects dust from day to day, and while not as big as the Fear Factor Stadium over in Studios, it could house another live show that can seat a fair amount of people. I mean, it's only a little smaller than Fear Factor. It would be a great way to reuse old space, and I would love to actually just see something happen to the stadium if they're going to keep it around. The second one is the old Sinbad stage, which closed during the construction of Hagrid's and was used as my favorite mask-free zone in the park during the dark days of 2020. It is the larger of the two, even being slightly larger than Fear Factor, so this could likely house the event's premiere show. Now while shows seem pretty simple to plan out, scare zones are a little trickier because of those natural bottlenecks that I kind of discussed earlier. Some areas like Port of Entry, Superhero Island, or Toon Lagoon can work for scare zones as they have in the past, but because of the popularity and or brand independence, Jurassic Park, Hogsmeade, and Seuss Landing wouldn't really work for scare zones. However, with Port of Entry, Superhero Island, Toon Lagoon, and Lost Continent, four scare zones is still a pretty solid amount even if you're knocking out the other three. Now, while space logistics, while fun for me, may not be the most entertaining thing for people that want to speculate about HHN, so let's talk about the theming possibilities that could be in some of these offerings. Now, while Islands of Fear is known for its icons, I don't think we would see any of the main icons return, unless this was done on an anniversary year. Universal has shown that the icons are used sparingly nowadays, so I don't see them bringing back the caretaker or the director, especially if this isn't the main event. However, if we were to see any icons, Cindy finally getting her time to shine wouldn't be the worst idea. Out of all the icons, she has easily been the most overlooked, and the original event was supposed to feature her as the icon, so maybe that could come back. The original event also had that unique quality of being themed to Islands of Adventure with the scary twist, so maybe some of those ideas can make their way to this new Islands of Fear. For example, the Port of Entry Scare Zone could incorporate elements from the previous Port of Evil Scare Zone with the Stilt Walk and the Cursed Explorers slash Pirate theme. Also, the Lost Continent offerings could really play into the dark side of mythology, with a massive house and scare zone themed to Atlantis or Hades Underworld. 
and those themes could play into the Sinbad show, which could be a more ancient take on a Nightmare Fuel type stunt show with pyro and cool stunt effects. I think Nightmare Fuel, while popular, could use a shakeup, and creating a show surrounding a distinct theme as this one with those classic Nightmare Fuel isms would be really interesting and could be pretty popular. Also, they could bring back Cheeks and Foons, but you know what I think would be a really interesting addition to that scare zone? Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Imagine a battle between the clowns and the treeks and foons where you're caught in the middle wafting through bubbles and cotton candy and it's just a bunch of chaos. I feel like both groups would benefit from the cartoony Toon Lagoon sets and it could be a more fun offering at this event. Plus, Toon Lagoon is quite large. You can have this scare zone be in the main street and also bleed into the Popeye and Bluto's area maybe. Now as far as a show for the Toon Lagoon stage, I think bringing back another fan favorite would be in order for this space. Yes, I'm talking about the dearly missed Beetlejuice Graveyard Review. Obviously, the show wouldn't be exactly the same as the original one in Universal Studios Florida, but I'm thinking something along the lines of a Beetlejuice themed musical show, possibly with songs from the Beetlejuice musical. You could involve the Universal Monsters in there, although I know they're trying to go a little more serious with that brand. Again, this would provide another live show offering that would be very popular, and it would just be great for longtime fans of the Universal Parks. Now as far as the houses go, the Carnage Warehouse one would likely be an original and wouldn't really have to tie in with any surrounding area as it does exist behind the main park area. I say original because you have a lot more freedom to play with the somewhat small scale of the building, I mean I did say it was about the size of a sprung tent, and with IPs nowadays they tend to put them in the bigger buildings like parade buildings and sound stages, so you don't really have those scale constraints when it comes to original, so I think that might be why this Carnage Warehouse house would end up being an original house. However, I think the Soundstage 20 house could really be the best of both worlds, bringing in both an IP and an original. And I thought hard about possible IPs for this space, and because it wouldn't really be possible anywhere else in the park, how about a house sequel to JP Extinction? It could utilize some of the puppetry used for the raptor meet and greets, along with a really dark jungle setting that we haven't seen at HHN in quite a while. It's a soundstage house, so it could be big, and it can be like an IP original because Jurassic Park is owned by Universal. This wouldn't be a play-by-play -play recreation of any of the movies or even the previous house, it would just be something new altogether, but taking that scary nighttime dinosaurs loose on the run theme could be really interesting. The other space could be whatever. It could be any type of original, it could be another IP. As long as I get my scary dinosaurs, I will be a happy guy. And with this event, I know I said they can't really do much in Hogsmeade, but I would love to see more Death Eaters. They're great as they are, they're always a pleasure to see and I know everybody loves to see them. So maybe having them roaming up to the Hogwarts Express, or on the stage next to Flight of the Hippogriff, or just more scattered throughout, we just need more of them. Although it would probably be best if they were more elevated, kind of like the faux scare zone they had over at Universal Hollywood when they brought the Death Eaters in. Less of them roaming in the streets to prevent the bottlenecks, and as much as you can. Island's Adventure is a fantastic park, and I know Universal likes to keep it open while Halloween Horror Nights is going on at studios, but adding it to HHN with even just a few experiences would be such a cool idea. Will it come back? I'm not sure. And if it does, it will likely come once Epic Universe opens, but hey, Universal could surprise us they could pull it out for next year, who knows? But hey, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments. Do you think Islands of Fear will ever return? And if it does, what would you like to see at that event? Let me know. I would like to hear your thoughts. If you like this video, want to see more Halloween Horror Nights videos, want to see more videos talking about theme parks and stuff, leave a like and subscribe. I really would appreciate it. I appreciate uh, any kind of engagement you all leave on the video. So thank you all. And I really, really appreciate it. One more time. Thanks for watching, everybody. And of course, I will see you all next time. The adventure lives on.